Hey there. If you've been enjoying the Unchained Binge podcast, you should know that this podcast, like everything else we do here at the Escape Collective, is member-funded. That means we're funded by, well, you, if you're already a member. And if you're not, we hope you'll think about becoming one. You can head on over to escapecollective.com slash join to sign up and become part of a pretty awesome community. It's a community that supports this podcast and the others on the Escape Collective podcast network, as well as everything that we write about bikes and more over on the escapecollective.com website. It's also a community with a very active Discord channel where we sometimes do live recordings of podcasts, by the way. In other words, there are lots of reasons to sign up. Our monthly memberships start at $11.99 USD, or you can save 30% by signing up annually. We'd love to have you as a member. And again, you can head over to escapecollective.com slash join to find out more and sign up. This is the Unchained Binge Podcast. I'm Kaylee Fretz, and we're going to go deep on Netflix's new Tour de France docuseries. Today is episode four, Attack, Counterattack. In today's episode, we get an inside the car view of one of the greatest stages in modern Tour de France history, stage 11 over the Telegraph, Galibier, and Grenoble. The yellow jersey is on the line, and Yumbo Visma throws everything they have at Tade Pogacar. Let's get into it. Maybe the place to start this episode is the fact that I loved this episode. Did you guys love this episode? I think it was the best one so far. For for a bike racing fan watching this, hoping to see some some bike racing, it was definitely the best episode so far. Yeah, I, I got chills when they were going up the Galibier and attacking each other. Although that might just be because I watched it early morning in Scotland. But it's yeah, uh, the when they were, when all the tactics were unfolding and it was all bombastic cinematic music. Um, yeah, I was invested. I think for for me the bit that was so exciting about it is that we didn't actually get to see any of that when it was happening so it was kind of cool to to see the the things yeah the context the there things. is is that ian you and i were on the side of the glibier in fact i i paused a couple times as we were watching to see if because it looked like the corner that we were on yeah uh and i'm pretty sure we're in the shot somewhere but yeah, we had made the decision to go make a podcast on the side of the Glibia that day, and sort of do the, the you know the color podcast, a color episode thing. And uh, as a result, we missed the majority of the stage. We could see as they went by us, and then we could see a little bit. We we, we were like ducking our heads into an RV uh, camper van and and trying to watch on a little TV that was in there. So like that, but that that's how we watched the stage. And for, so for me, like there were a lot of details of that stage that I was actually seeing for the first time uh, at. On Unchained, which was kind of fun, I enjoyed it. It did. It, it felt like okay, we're on we're on episode four now, and it felt like uh, almost like a reward for the cycling fans that have stuck it out this far, that like wanted a bunch of bike racing and wanted like tactics and 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 a real breakdown of a stage with some behind the scenes stuff. It, it felt like a bit of a reward in that respect. It also felt like we finally got the the outcome of some of the team stuff with Yumbo Visma, um, in particular the sort of Wout Vingigo, although that pops up again. It'll, it will pop up again later in the in the Tour de France. Uh, so yeah, it kind of wrapped up, it kind of wrapped those things up nicely, I think. Yeah, I think sticking with the, uh, with the arc of the whole thing for cycling fans, I also found, I mean, if I've got one quibble with this episode... And it's only minor because I re- I know why they did it, but it's returning to the La Planche. Um, so well after we had it in um, in stage three with the Pino storyline, and yeah, I get you know they had to set up the Vingo Pogacar um, rivalry, um, especially putting Vingo on the back foot. Um, but it's a bit you know it, especially if you watch them one one after the other, it's like oh wait, but we've just seen this and it's almost. A little tiresome, but you get then the build up towards the Granon, well, the Galibier Granon stage. 
Yeah, I think one of the from the very be- in the very beginning of the episode, I was kind of put off because one of my least favorite things about the uh, Drive to Survive series is that they jump around in the calendar to for each episode because they're following teams, you know, instead. And in the beginning, I was like, oh, no, they're going to jump around stages and that's going to completely like torpedo this series in my eyes. So I'm glad it was only like a like a couple minutes of like a flashback and it made more sense in the context of the episode for a bit. But for a second, I was quite worried. I think that in this case, uh, yeah, I mean, the the GC stuff doesn't really come into it until episode four, which is kind of kind of noteworthy. But I I liked that there was more Pigacha and even though his absence is quite keenly felt throughout the the series so far, I, I liked that there were these little glimpses of personality and some uh, kind of interesting talking heads moments where they were explaining how he was uh, this, this killer on a bike, a masochist and a sadist as well. <laughs> you don't want to poke the bear. Um, I, I thought that that was quite... Uh, quite an interesting way of going about it. And I I also thought it was really intelligently done throughout this episode. Um, Having, having not really spent a lot of time on his GC superiority to in a relatively short window, get through punch to Belfi and then the stage win. And then uh, the other stage where he, he got away off the front. So I, I think that that quite, quite succinctly built this narrative of this guy that, I mean, we probably felt it when we were watching the race as well, first time around, that it was just that the race was his for the taking and it was almost unexpected when when it went the way it did. We should talk maybe a little bit about the tactics of the day because that, that's, the, that's the story of this episode is, is the fact that a team was able to overcome an individual. Like that's the underlying theme here. And... I do think we kind of learned some things. Uh, there were hints of this prior, but you know, in the aftermath of, of this stage, all of the dis- sort of discussion was around kind of the genius of Yumbo Visma and the fact that they had put together this 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 brilliant master plan, and you know, ostensibly then that that that's the director sportif, that's the it's whoever makes that plan, right? But it it appeared from this episode, and I would be interested in in sort of following up on this when we get to the tour this year. Uh, it appeared from this episode that it was really like the the plan was just keep attacking him. It was basically as simple as that: make it really really hard, use Roglic, keep attacking him. But the actual sort of details of that plan, based on some of the quotes that we heard, including the one, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but basically when Christian Nierman went to Roglic and said you know, go whenever you feel is right, right? Like, it wasn't like they had determined that over the top of the telegraph was the perfect moment for Roglic to attack. Roglic appeared to determine that on his own. And so, therefore, that that kind of shifts the, the, well, the kudos, basically, from the team to Primoz Roglic and, and kind of paints, it. this, this kind of paints him as a bit of a kind of tactical mastermind in a, in a very subtle way. And I thought that was a really interesting shift in the way that we understand this stage, which let's be clear, like this is one of the most exciting, best stages of the Tour de France in recent memory. And to have it kind of fundamentally shift the way that we view it, I, I think this episode actually kind of added a lot to the the sort of broader conversation around, around last year's Tour de France. I'm shifted the way we view the stage, but I think really shifted like how we view Roglic and how we're going to view Roglic going forward as well. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, it it was um, certainly insinuated in the episode that I think it was one of the Dutch riders, Benuto Kreiswick, came up to the uh, director's car. I think on the Lasse de Montvernier, that's at least the uh, suggestion that the episode gave us, which was the first short climb of the day before the telegraph. Um, and he basically said, Roglic is itching to go. He's itching to do something. When can we, you know, bring down the hammer? And yeah, so it's, it's this, um, he's he's feeling energetic, he's feeling good, he's feeling recovered after stage five's fiasco for him with his crash. Um, but yeah, like Abby said, I think in, in a way, and certainly early on in his career, 
Roglic was this guy with raw power, a real um, lifetime of get of being lean in the sports that he's done before, and uh, you know be, really knowing his body, but that the tactical knowledge was maybe a little bit um, lacking um, at times, or at least his knowledge of I don't, I don't know getting around the peloton and what to do in certain circumstances. But yeah, it, that he was ready to go when he did, and uh, then continued to work Pogacar in that you know, the the long climb of the Galibier along with Vingigo. Um, yeah, it was a real revelation. To break down the tax even further, so it's worth kind of talking a little bit about exactly what happened, which is, it's actually quite a basic tactic, right? You have, you have numerical superiority, and so you hit out over and over and over again. And what we saw in this episode was a pretty faithful reenactment uh, or, or re- reflection of what actually happened in the day, which was... You know, Roglic attacked over the top of the telegraph. He kind of pulled away. Uh, well, he pulled Pogacar away from the rest of his team, isolating Pogacar. And that was really the first thing that they needed to do. And it's what made that particular moment to attack sort of so brilliant is that, that he clearly noticed that Pogacar was relatively isolated. And all they had to do was kind of stretch the elastic out and pull him away from his team. And all of a sudden they had this, this, this massive numerical superiority. And then they just took turns right and and the way the reason why that works is you're just forcing one rider to chase all of these different moves and it, it wastes a huge amount of energy not just in sort of like the the power output but also in you know <laughs> trying to get water trying to get food in you're, you're you're preventing the the your opponent from kind of like staying within themselves in the way that they would probably want to and that's why in the end, those things all combined is probably why it was successful on the Grenon, uh, because more than anything, Pogacar just cracked, right? And that's they, they needed to do all that work on the Glibia to make sure that he cracked later on. I, I feel like it's also worth worth mentioning there was like a lot going on that we didn't see. Like there was um, Wout Van Aert in a break earlier in the stage, so he... And Laporte was just over the other side of the telegraph. Yeah, so the point... The point of him being in the break was, well, to get, he got some sprint points to bolster his green jersey, which hasn't yet been explained at all in the show. Um, But it, but it is like there are points across the course where you get points. There are, there are lines on the course, random lines on the course, and you get points there. And then it all goes to a cumulative tally where you can win a green jersey at the end of the race. I don't know. I hope they explain it better. They probably won't. Um, but Wout was out front to get some points, but also to put him as a bigger guy. He doesn't climb as well. And over the first couple climbs, he might have been distanced. So he got out in front. And so he was there when they led into the base of the Grenon climb. He was actually in the peloton and he did a really big turn to speed things up before they hit the base of the climb. So not only did they have, you know, Sepp as an amazing domestique with Roglic and Vinigo, and then those three Jumbo Visma riders able to take on Pog. They also had another rider up the road to be able to help later on in the race, and it did all come back together. Like we had that amazing stretch of road where we had, you know, the heavy hitters all like slugging each other, but then that all came back together before the final climb. So there was like so much that happened in this stage of bike racing that was just insane. And I feel like this episode was really good, but like it couldn't, it would have to be another two hours long to scratch the surface of all of the layers of tactical genius that we saw happen on this day of bike racing. Another point that's probably worth mentioning that isn't really clear from the narrative of the show is that one of the reasons why it worked for Roglic to go off the off the front on the telegraph is because he was still kind of in striking distance of the lead. The way that this is edited, it appears as if he's um, obviously he crashed on stage five and dislocated his shoulder and was was not in the best of shape, um, or probably not in, not as good shape as being a god anyway. But he was still w- less than three minutes behind the, the race lead, just outside of the top ten. So Pogaccio couldn't let him go. It's not like it was just some minor Jumbo-Visma domestique that was away. This was somebody that feasibly could still have uh, gone for the race lead. And at that point, they hadn't really played their cards as to who was going to be the um, designated leader. They were still 
to all appearances, looking like they had a, a dual leadership strategy at that point. Yeah, and that becomes even more relevant almost when you look back at it at the end of the day, given that um, Pogacar lost two minutes 50 on that final climb. You know, Roglic at the beginning of the day was in the same position as as Pogacar was at the end. Um, but yeah, like I mean, <laughs> I was remembering was as I watched this, that, you know, when the group came together, obviously Pogacar had, as um, Steve Chanel was saying, they'd been boxing for uh, however many kilometres in the valley and then into the Galibier. Um, but when the GC group comes back together, I remember feeling, watching the stage, oh man, was that was that just a sign of what might have happened? And then Pogacar's going to be fine and if any time is lost, it's going to be minimal on that final climb. But um, yeah, it, I, I suppose in a way... The episode by not showing us so much of that detail and uh, and the bigger group, you almost get more drama by condensing it um, because you've still got Pogacar being weak and he's just been begging for water, slurring for water um, into his microphone, uh, into his radio, sorry. And so to to really explain what's going on might have given him more strength. I don't know. I felt like that final climb. Pogacar was on his knees and you got that great line from Steve Cummings saying that he looked terrible um, just before Vingigo went bang off the front. I think one downside of UAE not being involved is that they don't look as confident as Jumbo Visma because the way that this was set up, Jumbo Visma was on top of their rider's hydration. They were handing ice blocks out of the window of the car. They were doing all of these things to set the, set the stage up for, for their guys. And meanwhile, you've got Tadej Pogacar, you know, slurring, I need water. Um, and I mean, the UAE was probably doing exactly the same things, but it's kind of, when it's cut in this way, it's kind of damning uh, that it doesn't look like they're doing those things. It looks like he's isolated, probably more isolated than he he really was. It's interesting that we haven't, they've obviously introduced Pogacar being, you know, who he is but they haven't mentioned they they don't feature UAE but they also haven't mentioned a single one of his teammates he's like he is his own like standalone human being and he has no one <laughs> he's got no teammates he's got no team he's just out there on his own I think that plays into the bad guy thing because you can't Pogacar is not an easy guy to paint as bad i mean when they were talking about him being a sadist and a masochist the shot that they had of him was him grinning on the start line and that doesn't help <laughs> but it was but how when... he was grinning it was <laughs> grinning maniacally perhaps a uh... manic grin in slow motion <laughs> yeah but but when they get onto the into the stage itself and he's looking you know he's he's in a zone whether it's the zone probably not um and then you know he is isolated and there's this sort of ominous soundtrack it works for the um and you know you've got the avengers they've got all their uh this is not this is a very not kit reference by the way i'm not a marvel fan but <laughs> but you've got the good guys always have friends right the bad guys can't have friends or you can empathize with them and obviously we all empathize with pocket child because he's a human being he's not got a mask and a cloak whatever but you know i think that plays it actually plays into the episode quite well because if we had UAE you wouldn't see the that you wouldn't have the oomph behind the Jumbo Visma story mm. although like the, the 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 poke the bear stuff for me was this attempt to show I guess that the rest of the peloton is scared of him is scared of Pogacar like that that's the that's the kind of the only angle they could take because he's not you know in and of himself a particularly threatening looking human being uh he's a you know in real life he's a pretty smiley guy he's a pretty uh he's he's a he's a bit of a prankster um loves a good meme and so how do you how do you make that into darth vader like that you're you're gonna struggle with that and sort of the only way to do it i think it was to talk about the fact that the entire rest of the peloton is basically terrified that if he decides to go you can't do anything about it because really other than this stage and it's what made this stage the stage 11 so good is that's that's like the only time we've seen any anything else, right? Like we ev almost every time Tadej Pogacar has wanted to win a bike race in the last couple of years, he has won that bike race. And, and yeah, if you're anybody else in the entire peloton, that's a terrifying prospect. 
and that is also what made this stage so good. Yeah, I mean, and then you, we had Seb Piquet's quote in the car when he said something. What did he say? He asked Pogacar what he would do, or when he would attack. When he would attack Pogacar if he was a Jumbo Visma rider, and he asked this to the man himself, and he said, "I wouldn't." And that's so. That's <laughs> you could you could look at that as oh well, we know that that's just uh, Pogacar being a walking meme, but um, yeah, I guess you could, and maybe Netflix wanted you to take it as oh he's. He knows what he's doing. He's he's he knows he's strong. But yeah, like you say, it, this was the first time we'd ever seen any weakness from him, besides crashing, and we'd rarely seen him crash. Um, I think we saw a little bit later in the tour, but um, we haven't got that yet. But yeah, so this was the first, and this was a proper weakness. I mean, two minutes fifty um, for Pogacar is a loss. Is huge. It's huge for anyone, really. We let's pivot over to Jonas Vingegaard a little bit. Because we got a lot more of him in this episode as well. We got a lot more kind of rounding out of his character. Uh, I do think that, you know, we've talked a bunch of times in these podcasts about sort of the creation of these characters, right? And and for the most part, these characters feel relatively accurate to the, the actual individual. Although, like, Pogacar being the bad guy is, again, a bit a bit strange. And I think that Vingago being this kind of like hero figure is also really kind of, kind of a difficult one to sell because he's so quiet and it almost feels like the way that they have tried to do this is, is trying to like infantilize him a little bit, like like make him this little child. Make and, him the boy wonder. Yeah, the boy wonder. And I think it kind of works and that's more, it's just more down to like what he looks like and how sort of diminutive he is and all the rest. But also, I think I think he's he's much more of a killer than than the series is kind of letting on for most of most of the intro here. Also, in the context of modern cycling, he's not a child anymore. No, he has a child. Well, that's yeah, true, he, but he's, he's also not, not twenty. He has, he's in his. He has a child. <laughs> yeah, he's in his he's in his mid to late twenties, which at this point, and last year as well, was kind of old. I mean, obviously not in the in the recent history of the sport, if you go back to a couple of decades, but with Pogacar and Bernal um, in Tour de France winning, I don't know, in the past few years, Vingago is positively aging. Yeah, what is he, 20, 25, 26? 26? So he's, so he's a couple of years older than, than Pogacar, and yet they tried to turn him into the child, which I think is a really interesting thing to to attempt to do. And there's no question that he is the underdog in this. Like, he doesn't feel so much now because we've seen him win a Tour de France. Like, we know how this ends. So he doesn't feel as much like an underdog to, to us today as he would have on stage 10 last year, right? But he, he truly did. I mean, you know, we were all, we all went into last year's Tour de France basically assuming that the only way that Tade Pogaccio was going to lose this thing was if he fell off his bike, right? Which turns out he I did later. I beg to differ. I, I was one of those who predicted that Vingegaard was going to win. And, but, you know, yeah, but yeah. you were just, you were just trying to be a hipster about it and, and pick <laughs> Me something and Johnny, weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I promise you, uh, and I, I know uh, it's easy to say, but I did. I really I did. Having watched the tour the year before, I really did. But anyway, we, that's it's, it does me no favors to bang <laughs> that drum, probably. <laughs> anyway, the rest of us, those yeah. without a crystal ball, we were all looking at this basically being like, ah, okay, well, like maybe he'll give him a run for his money, but Pogaccio was so dominant for, for a couple of years prior that like, yeah, the chances looked very slim. And so I, I do think that... Uh, some of their attempts to create this character around Vingago, they do actually kind of reflect the way that we all felt about him prior to this stage. So from that perspective, I guess that's kind of kind of an accurate, somewhat accurate portrayal. But again, this, this sort of like turning him into this child, uh, it felt like a means to an end to get us to kind of empathize with him. But it, 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 that's probably not the most accurate way to, to, to build that character. Yeah, I think the underdog... Uh, characterization is definitely true and I you know I, I love an underdog so it's maybe that's part of it as well but anyway he he, there is that in his DNA for sure but he also and I've noticed it more recently as well um, with some of the interviews he's been giving as he continues to win things but in the because he had a lot to say in this episode for obvious reasons but um, he came across as he was very chilled uh, except when he was doing the awkward 
gif thing with the um, organization when he was doing the winning <laughs> funny moment um he looked very awkward there but when he was talking about bike racing i began to want, i began well i began to get the impression you know there's a killer instinct in there and we've seen that um in the way he races you know he really is sharply focused on what he's doing um and that ca- comes across when he's uh, when he's on screen in those talking heads I think yes in in the sporting context, but I think he's still kind of enigmatic as a as an individual and yeah, for sure. continues to be. Like a, this is a man whose most interesting trait is that he loves his family. I mean, cool. Uh, well, he's, he worked in a fish farm. That's quite that's quite fun. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's something else. But I, I don't know. I, I don't uh, get much of a sense of him as having a complete and vibrant life outside of cycling in the way that you might for. Tele Pagacha, for instance. Yeah, he's not making rap videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. They could have like really played into the family aspect and how much he because I think like for some of us who are fans of this guy, it's because he just absolutely loves his family. And I think they could have done a better job of like maybe showing him if he was okay with it obviously like with his partner and his and his kid and showing him doing things with his daughter like out and about there's like photos of him like um fishing with his daughter like doing doing fish related things with his daughter on his instagram like they could have done that and they could have really played into the father aspect and i think that that would have maybe um inspired put a little like it's been more inspirational for him as a character in a TV show than, you know, being a child. But that's so. that's the problem, right? Is they they made they made the child decision and and that's runs sort of fundamentally counter to to being a father, right? Like you you, you can't paint him as child David taking on Goliath if he's like a a dad with a family. Like that those two you can't be a child and a dad <laughs> at the same time and i think that that's probably part of the problem is like to 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 infantilize him and make him feel like this sort of like yeah this this individual that was like one of the scenes that 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 really made me feel like they were doing this was the one where i can't remember if it was in this episode or a prior one where he's just sitting cross-legged on on a bed yeah. and they're trying to he's like they're convincing him like you're good enough like you can do this like you are strong enough you you can win this bike race like and he's just sitting there kind of like oh okay i'll try yeah, and his matching bedding <laughs> yeah exactly like, i want to know more about this vinigo like look at his his daughter's got this tiny little yellow vespa and oh, he's just he's just sitting there watching her like unwrap her Christmas present. And he just looks like just as stoked as her to be, you know, hanging He's out. He's a child Christmas opening morning. Christmas presents. Abby's showing us like, an Instagram photo, uh, from, from Jonas Vingigo's account. And that is yeah. cute. He does look picnicking with the family kid have worked. I don't know. Yeah. Like that just is so much. Yeah. I think that would have been, so they had, they had to fundamentally, they, they, they had to sit down and decide, you know what character is the most effective in this narrative and they decided that the character that was most effective in this narrative was child vingigo and i don't think that that's particularly accurate except for the way he looks right mm. the way that he actually acts and the way that he operates not childlike really in any way but they made this call and i think that's why they couldn't include stuff like the fatherhood because that would that would that kind of ruins the the child vibe that they were trying to do and i, I do think it's somewhat disingenuous in the way that they have they have sort of created that character as a as a uh an opposite to the kind of big scary tari pogacha character but i think that it also seems to sneak through a little bit in the way that jumbo visma seemed to conceptualize him in uh, in this episode, Grisha Neiman refers to him as little one, and then at the top of it, he gives him this big sort of paternal embrace, and Fingergord's just sort of like slumped on his shoulder. And I think that those moments feel like it's not just uh, not just Netflix setting this narrative; it's almost like he is this uh, protected sort of favourite child within the team. Mm. Yeah, I think one of the moments we saw most personality and that's not a slight to, I, I'm like like Abby I, I really like Vingigo but um, 
the, one of my favourite moments of the episode was when it was so it was after the La Planche de Belfi stage when he'd gone too early and he's on the bus and he's taking his radio out of his jersey and he's going oh it's super fucking stupid he'd gone too early and then the director I'm not sure who it was but um, grabbed him by the neck and just kind of did the whole you know squeezing the tickle kind of motion I don't know it's just that when and he just it seemed like that playful like you say the little guy the one we've got to keep in check um on the rain in the reins um and uh so I do I actually yeah, I think I agree that there might be that sort of dynamic within the team and they are quite an old team um as teams go and we're going to get into that in future episodes but you know with Christwick and uh Roglic um They've got some quite uh, elder statesmen who've been around a bit. Um, so I guess, you know, maybe that maybe that comes through. Maybe and also, that. also Wout Van Aert, who is not that much older than him. Uh, He's been around a lot. <laughs> just down the other end of the bus in his deep voice, like six and a half foot of green giant, just being like, exactly. the last climb is fucking hard. <laughs> and then Vicky God's yeah, just, like, just this little kid down the other end being like, oh, that sounds scary. Yeah, people have pointed out on our, on our group, on the uh, Discord we've got for this podcast, that um, painting Wout van Aert as the bad guy has been was really kind of really specific early, in, early, in early episodes. And it it seems like, you know, that wasn't just an editorial decision, maybe. Because he's not the person to be saying that's a really, really hard climb. It seemed really odd that it was him telling telling Vingegaard that because he's like you say he's the big guy plowing through the flat and he can climb we've seen that but it seemed like I guess he's the the uh, the captain the road captain of sorts as well but it just seemed like uh, playing into the bad guy character way before it had even been conceived by Netflix <laughs> I mean you get the sense that Wafan is is part DS on this team right that he has a fair amount of sway in tactical decisions and and we know this from from some of the sort of the drama that they created between those two earlier in the in the series and it it will it will very likely crop up again later in the series given what we know about what happens in the tour de france one more thing on the on the editing decisions like i think yes that there there's they're obviously professionals they would know you know how to find a story in the mess of the Tour de France and make it a feature of a Netflix show but I guess like we said we didn't want to always call back to Drive to Survive but it is you know the same production team and on Drive to Survive I I think one of my main problems with the show is how poorly they highlight the actual characters of the play of the people involved um the good side they really like to highlight all the negative um for clicks and for views and as somebody who is pretty close to the peloton and knows some riders personally it it's worrying that (laughs) netflix would take some out some lines out of context and also like highlight some characteristic traits more than others that are just like kind of in passing just to kind of make the show more interesting when I think that there are some really interesting characters that they could have that they could focus on or like some really interesting parts about some people that they could focus on that could still make for a really good story but just without like kind of ruining these guys lives (laughs) Um, and so I think that that's where me being more critical and more disheartened by the portrayal of Vinigo and his bits are not nearly as bad as as some other writers so I think it's like not gonna hurt him personally the way that he's been edited but I also think like maybe a journal a cycling journalist should have been in the room when they made the decisions Mm. what's surprising then is that teams weren't I mean it's probably a good thing in a lot of ways but it's a little surprising maybe that there wasn't uh, a kind of sign-off. But maybe that was in the c- contracts when they... Well, that's why people said no. That's, that's true, isn't it? That's why people that's said why no. That's why Trek yeah. said no. There was no real sign-off. What there was is, if from, from what I understand from talking with some folks that work with teams, is they were shown sort of relevant sections to them uh, a, a, quite a while ago. 
and essentially like open a dialogue where if something was like a true no-go then they were sort of open to that negotiation but as far as i know that didn't actually end up impacting the yeah i mean you, you don't want result. to give away it, it was like trade Netflix. secrets and things like that that was the yeah. only thing they could truly protect you don't want to give away uh editorial power to anyone especially not the subject but uh yeah. Kaylee, wasn't it you who said before that there was, when they did the editing, they had non cyclists, non cycling fans who were like in the editing room to tell them what storylines were the most. The, were the, the editors like, themselves the weren't. The editors themselves aren't cyclists. And, and the producer that isn't a cyclist. That yeah. Is like part of the problem. Like, could they not have had a healthy mix of both? Yeah. But like who who in who in the show? I mean, they, the the characters have been flattened, obviously, because you've got you've got eight hours, not even eight hours. You have you have six and a half hours ish of of you know show to tell very complicated stories. So obviously, the characters have been flattened. But I don't I don't see how any character so far has been has been not at least mostly faithfully portrayed. Like yes, Vingigo has been has been turned into a child. I think you can see from the way that he rides that like they, they, they have a bit of balance to that as well. Nobody else has been, I mean, Julian Jardy is, is the, is the, or Julian Jardy is the only one that has come across to me so far in this entire show as, as an idiot. <laughs> I, I disagree that they've been flattened. I think they've been reduced um, to one trait. Um, and I guess so, that's what yeah. I mean. Yeah. They've been narrowed. Yeah. yeah fair enough. Um, because you've, yeah, you've, you've, you've got Jardy being bit of a nutcase they've got that one element of his personality you've got Vingigo being the underdog being his one part of the I think the, the the one that stood out most to me is I mean and I'm not part of the peloton and I've never uh, been up that close to it but it's uh you know the Van Art being bad guy I'd always got the impression that he's one of the well, obviously he's a, got that killer instinct of a very prolific bike racer but he does he I think he's been the most surprising character to me um through the these first few episodes so Ineos in this show is painted kind of like the way you probably should have painted Sky like eight years ago, which doesn't feel entirely um, accurate for the strength of that team in the 2022 Tour de France. And the only person that they kind of use to, to do that is Jonathan Vodders, where he mentions the fact that they have all this money, right? And I guess that the, the it's, I don't know, it's kind of funny to view Ineos as this like juggernaut because in the 2022 Tour, they were just like hanging on to third place by the skin of their teeth, right? Like it, they were not a juggernaut in any way in this in this particular Tour de France. That that's not to say that they won't be back. It's certainly not to say that they didn't. I mean, they dominated tours for close to a decade, but in this particular tour, I think painting them as as like this big bad guy is a bit. It's a bit, bit silly, and we do get a bit more of the kind of human side of this team. And in particular, we get a bunch of time like at home with. Garen Thomas, which I, I really enjoyed that bit. I think a bit of context for that lack of juggernaut status is that they started 2022 with a previous Tour de France with, well, two previous Tour de France winners, but one who was expected to contest the overall in 2022, and then he crashed into the back of a bus. Um, so they probably hoped, and Netflix probably also hoped, that Egan Bernal would be at the Tour as at least the podium contender who would be the I don't know the third uh the third fighter in the ring um so yeah that adding that bit of uh context to the whole situation is something that well it's something that we know that the viewers don't that the, the a, a non-cycling viewer would, would not really necessarily know so we you know <laughs> the whole Ineos is a force to be reckoned with it kind of works in history, but yeah, like you say, it's a bit but not in like, hollow. But not in this actual bike race. And they just yeah. get portrayed as, you know, Garrett Thomas is, you've got the boy Vingigo and the old man Garrett Thomas, who's mm -hmm. sitting on this, 
but lying on a massage table talking about having to snap him. <laughs> uh, maybe we should actually mention why they're just always getting massages. Because this happens a lot in this series <laughs> that they're like filming the guys getting massages. And um, maybe there's maybe there's an explanation there. They, they need their little treat. <laughs> <laughs> they finish their big day on the bike and they, they need their reward. <laughs> I mean, basically. basically. <laughs> yeah. You know. Trying to get the trying to get all the the crap out of the legs, basically. It flushes, yeah, yeah, flushes out the muscles, helps a little bit with recovery. Yeah, and it's probably just like re- relaxing. It you is know? really Which... relaxing. Well, that depends who your spawner is. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't want it to be that relaxing. If it's relaxing it's enough to fall asleep, it's not doing its job. Yeah. Are you telling me there's not cucumbers over the eyes? We had a one year once that you'd walk into his into his massage room and there would be like candles and fragrance and he'd be playing super calm music and he would start by just kind of lathering you up. And after like about, I don't know, two days, we were like, yeah, we don't really need massages anymore. Thanks, though. We'll use the, the Normatec boots. Thank you. Oh, dear. <laughs> what else did we learn about about Garen Thomas? In this. I, I rem- it, it was a nice reminder of how good he looked on that stage. I mean, he was obviously he was ready to um, to follow, thanks in part to Steve Cummings saying, I've got a feeling Yumba Visma are going to do something. And that's another point. Steve Cummings painted as he's just a staff member. He's not some bloke who won a bunch of Tour de France stages by doing rather similar things to what we see, you know, these tactical masterclasses. He knew how to race in the mountains. He knew how to win races. And I think that's slightly lacking. But then again, that's because I know who Steve Cummings is. But anyway, that that uh, readiness, you know, Garrett Thomas was the only other uh, GC contender to go with the top two um, and Yumbo Visma. Um, and he looked great. And then uh, when on the Col de Granon, when Pogacar flicks the elbow to try and get Thomas to come through after Vingegaard's gone on the attack, Thomas goes... Uh, Actually, I'm just going to leave you behind, mate. And he goes <laughs> off up the mountain and takes back a little bit of time. Or actually, he would have probably said, I'll leave you behind, but, which seems to be his uh, his affectation for people. <laughs> it's the Welsh thing. He's like, right, but. <laughs> well, and, and so the old man, like, redemption arc thing, too, like the, the, the yeah. people people didn't think I could do this. I, I do think it's a, it's a useful character. Uh, I'm kind of glad that they included it. And, and, He's, I would say he's one of the most likable characters of the show so far. Most ordinary. Yeah. He just seems like a pretty blokey bloke, you know? Mm-hmm. I think he's also quite uh, quite unfiltered in interviews, and you can kind of see it when he's talking to media in this, uh, in this episode. He's pretty straight shooting. I think that it's a nice sort of counterbalance to this image of Ineos Grenadiers that they've created where they're this death star. And then here he is with his wife and his child and talking about how, how there are these risks in cycling and his, his wife talking about the fear that she has for him when he's riding. And I I think that that is something that has been lacking elsewhere in the, the show to this point, because it is, it is a very dangerous sport and you do see that, um, not through somebody, well, you do see footage of him crashing, but you, you sort of see the emotional impact of that on other people besides the rider. And I, I think that that's a valuable perspective to have and surprising to have that from from someone within the Ineos Grenadiers outfit. Uh, and he's always been a good talker too. I mean, like he's notorious within the sort of press corps that if you need a good quote from somebody in, at Ineos, you, you go to him, right? He He's... He could be cooling down after a hard stage. He could be, you know, it could be in a stressful situation. You stick a recorder in front of him and ask a question. He's still going to give you an answer, and it's and it's going to be a good one. And he doesn't. He's very professional in that way. And I think that, uh, frankly, like not all professional cyclists sort of understand that that is is part of their role is to provide insight into what has just happened uh, and he always has gotten that and i think that comes across in this show as well and that he's 
yeah, he's just very open and honest about sort of what he's going through and the things around him, and and that makes him such a likable character uh, within the within the context of of this show in particular. C- can we talk about the fake heavy breathing? Oh, I was going to say just about to say that. Yes, <laughs> I, I want to talk about the fake heavy breathing. Uh, <laughs> so there's a couple things that they're, that they're doing in the creation of the show that are intended to either like you know r- ramp up the drama or provide some context where context does not actually exist so one of the one of the things is they are absolutely doing some some sound design <laughs> they are they're adding heavy breathing they're like there's there's a one point uh on the grenon where they've got these sort of close-up shots of you know this go and you could hear him just rasping rasping breath like he's not mic'd up they don't have that audio that the, the, the there, it's very loud where he is. There's a helicopter. There's fans. There's like it's very loud. You 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 do not have that audio. It's not a and, helicopter. They're just banging halves of coconuts together. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all fake. Uh, they've added that in post. The other thing that I found really interesting that that I didn't actually really pick up on in the first couple episodes, but it's been happening since episode one, is a lot of the French commentary that sounds like it's coming straight off of like the actual French commentary from. Like if that yanked out of if you had actually been watching the Tour de France on French television last year, a lot of that is fake. So they use the same commentator, but if you pay very close attention to what he is saying, and they do the same thing in 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 Drive to Survive, he's they have bits of commentary that would never have actually been said in the actual bike race because they're talking about a rider who finished like eighty fifth on the stage. And the French commentary is not mentioning the fact that this rider came across the line in 85th, right? So I just found that interesting that they have, they've essentially given this, this, this commentator who, again, he, he is the actual commentator on French TV in the summer. They've given him a script and he is reading it like he's actually commentating on the bike race, but it's just for context. And it, the, the, the interesting thing to me about that is it is the one, it is one kind of, I don't know. Uh, point at which they've made an attempt to explain some of the things that are happening. They're trying to do it in a way that kind of fits in with the rest of the show quite quite naturally. But they've used if you if you pay attention to when that guy is talking, uh, they've used those moments to provide context for the rest of what's happening in the show uh, in a very kind of kind of clever way. So anyway, two two bits of faked <laughs> faked stuff in the in this in this series. We've got fake breathing and probably more, and we've got definitely sort of fake TV commentary. All right, I think it's time for us to wrap up here. Is that the best episode so far? You guys agree? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Most enjoyable for me, for sure. Not enough goats, but otherwise, <laughs> A+. Plus. I, I, yeah, so sort of like a, from a broader narrative perspective, I guess, yeah, you, you have sort of like the chaos of the first couple stages, then we have this slowdown in, in, the, in episode three. And now we've ramped back up into episode four. And I'm intrigued to see where episode five, six, seven, eight go. All right. Well, this has been the Unchained Binge podcast from the Escape Collective. Make sure you head over to escapecollective.com slash join if you want to support this podcast and the rest of the stuff that we do. And get all the fantastic Tour de France content that is going to be coming your way in the next couple weeks. We will be back with another episode. We'll be back with uh, with episode five, which is called Breakneck Speed. Breakneck Speed. That'll be a good one. All right, we'll be back with that as soon as we can record it. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Kaylee Fretz from Escape Collective here. If you've landed on this podcast because you just watched Unchained on Netflix and you want to dive headfirst into the Tour de France and pro bike racing, I have some great news for you. The crew behind this podcast cover pro cycling in depth 
365 days a year over at escapecollective.com. We're member-funded, meaning listeners and readers support what we do. So if you love this pod, head over to escapecollective.com slash join to sign up. Get all kinds of extra stuff. Get past the paywall. You get the best bike content anywhere. Thanks.